To this point in our examination of the Republic, we've been concerned with setting out two questions. First, the question, what is justice? And second, the question, is justice good? Now, Socrates himself introduced the question, what is justice? By seeing in Cephalus's remarks about old age and the best way to face death, an implicit definition of justice, namely telling the truth and, and giving back what you owe. A definition that Socrates pretty quickly showed to be inadequate. Now, Polemarchus's attempt to save something of his father's definition of justice, now understood as giving to each what's fitting, namely something good to friends and something bad to enemies, it looks for a while like it will do the trick, especially when it's improved by dropping the requirement of harming enemies. As human virtue or excellence, justice could never result in the harm of, of anybody. But it is at this point that Thrasymachus bursts onto the scene, and the dialogue is really never the same again. Now we have on the table the much more radical question, is justice good? Or is it, as Thrasymachus suggests, a kind of fraud perpetrated in every community by the strong against the weak? What is called justice, he says, is simply the advantage of the stronger, dressed up in highfalutin terms of moral obligation, duty, and so on. Terms the weak foolishly follow, all the while serving not their own good, but the good of another, the stronger. And as we've seen, both Glaucon and Adiamantus are dissatisfied with Socrates' responses to Thrasymachus. Those responses succeed in, you could say, shutting down Thrasymachus, but not in refuting him. Now, for a reason that's not immediately clear, Socrates proposes to discover what justice is, and hence its goodness, by building a city in speech, as he puts it. And not just any old city, but what turns out to be the best city, even as he will call it later, the city according to nature. But why? Because apparently the best community will also be the just one. And it will be easier for us beginners to spot justice first in the, the bigger thing, which of course is the political community, before we look for it in the smaller thing, in the individual. Now, in today's lecture, I propose to, to follow out Socrates' building of the best city in the first place. And then second, we'll try to discover along with him the definition of justice, the correct definition of justice. And this will take us to the end of Book 4 of the Republic. Now, I might just note here that uh, we, before we turn to the proper definition of justice and, and the determination that it is in fact good, what you'd think would be the climax, even the end of the Republic. In fact, there are six more books of the Republic to come after Book 4. The Republic is less than half over when we get our official definition of justice. Now this, I think, is, is one pretty obvious sign that Socrates' let's call it his official response to Glaucon and to Adiamantus at the end of Book 4, is not free of problems, or that, that Socrates still has something more to teach us about justice than he can accomplish in the first four books alone. And so, of course, the Republic will continue. So let's turn now to Socrates' building of the city, the polis in, in ancient Greek, or the political community. The city has its roots, according to Socrates, in the satisfaction of our most basic needs for food, for shelter, and clothing, in that order. And those needs we really can't meet easily or, or well as isolated individuals. And so, he says, we naturally come together to form partnerships. Each person will perform a specialized task farming, house building, shoe, shoemaking, and so on, and share the surplus of his art with others, and then each will do the same in turn. So if we follow out the logic of this, we see that their city quickly grows from a mere four or five people to, as he puts it, a throng of people, each of them contributing the, the sort of specialized skills that they're needed to produce goods and services for each and, and for all the citizens. 
So we have in this city already farmers, craftsmen, tradesmen, importers and exporters, uh, wage laborers, and so on. And this city, that's, uh, this city that Socrates goes so far as to call the true or the genuine city. And he means by that, I think, that all of its activities are rational because they speak to our true or genuine needs. So such a city dedicated in this way would be, in a way, the true or genuine city. So Socrates now asks, where's justice in our city now that we've built it? But Adiamantus, at least, can't quite identify it. And I think he has trouble identifying justice in the city for a very good reason. This true or genuine city, which meets only our bodily needs, could be said to operate on the basis of a kind of strictly enlightened selfishness rather than justice. After all, it amounts to this. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. You build me shoes, I'll build you a bed. Whatever we mean by justice, though, we have to mean, I think, something higher or nobler than a kind of collective or prudent selfishness. That no community can or, or at least does rest satisfied with these genuine, yes, but, but let's be frank, quite low or uninspiring goals becomes very clear, I think, through Glaucon's reaction to this city. He very famously calls this first city of ours a city of pigs, of sows. Glaucon wants, he says, a city where there are, as he puts it, relishes, delicacies available. Now, I think it's not, or, or not only, that Glaucon wants a more refined way to satisfy the body, though he may, may mean that as well. He wants, I think, a city in which something other, something higher than the satisfaction of bodily needs is a matter of public concern, political concern. So if from Socrates' point of view, this first city of sows is the true city in a way, in the sense that, that the goals that it meets are genuine ones, real ones, I think Socrates knows full well that really all cities also attempt to speak to those concerns of ours that, that somehow transcend the body, go above, above or beyond the body. Let me give, just to flesh this out, a contemporary example of the United States. In the U.S., the market economy has done an extraordinary job of providing us with food, shelter, clothing, and so on, and a great many luxuries, relishes, as Glaucon would say. I suppose it's fair to say that there has never been a nation on earth that has provided so much physical comfort to so many and so easily. But it's also true that the United States is dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal, that each of us as human beings is endowed with certain rights. The right to life, yes, which, which the city of Sows too is concerned with. But the United States is also dedicated to the right to liberty, freedom. And it's this right to liberty or freedom which is a good deal higher than any merely bodily need. So in the United States, too, yes, we have to be concerned with the body, but with things that transcend bodily need. So with Glaucon's criticism, the conversation takes a new turn. The community will grow ever bigger. Uh, and it's no surprise that pretty soon they're concerned with both foreign conquest, on the one hand, and domestic protection, on the other. These are concerns that, that loom large very quickly. In short, they need an army, not just farmers and tradesmen. And here Socrates raises the classic problem with an army. How can we create soldiers who are ferocious enough to fight and die for the community and be gentle enough to live in our own midst peacefully? It's with this problem that Socrates quietly introduces what will become, I think, the theme of the Republic eventually, education. And the first goal of this education is to fashion guardians or soldiers akin to noble puppies, as Socrates calls them. That is to say, friendly to what is their own, hostile to what is foreign, just like noble puppies. Now, in this way, the second and central of the definitions of justice in Book One is in a way restored. That is, Polemarchus's very political definition of, of helping friends and harming enemies. 
It's here, too, that Socrates first introduces the idea of philosophy explicitly. The guardians will have to be, among other things, he says, philosophic. Though here, that adjective seems to mean nothing much more exalted than having a certain kind of knowledge. And to anticipate the end of the Republic for a minute, if philosophy is here introduced as a necessary means to a political goal, eventually philosophy itself will become the goal to which everything else is but a means. And discovering the rationale for that change lies, I think, at the heart of the mystery of Plato's Republic. Now, we can't go through in, in great detail the really remarkable education needed to shape these soldiers who are at once tough and gentle. It includes the training of the soul first, then of the body, and among the qualities that this education should instill, uh, the leading are courage, of course, uh, a certain gravity or seriousness, they shouldn't tell a lot of jokes, truthfulness, they shouldn't lie, and moderation or self-control. But in much of the education, Socrates advocates what's clearly pretty shocking or at least repulsive to us, I suspect, and that is censorship. Censorship of music, of literature, of art. Why? How could he justify this? Here's his argument. All of these things, he says, what we would call cultural things, they have a profound effect on our souls. And for that very reason, they are properly, necessarily, the concern of the good community. The good community can't simply let such immensely powerful influences on us be left to develop willy-nilly. So Socrates is here concerned, above all, uh, about the accounts of the gods that the young people will hear. Why? Because there are, in the great poets whom we've met before, Homer and Hesiod, accounts of people fearing the afterlife, for example. And in the case of future warriors, that sets a very bad example. So, in his act of censorship, as I'm calling it, he takes a pair of scissors, so to speak, to the classic texts of the Greeks, cutting and chopping at will. And maybe the, the most famous deletion that Socrates makes here is found at the beginning of Book 3 of the Republic, and it concerns no less than Achilles arguably the greatest of the Greek heroes. Now, according to Homer, in the afterlife, Achilles famously regrets his decision to avenge the death of his comrade Patroclus at the expense of his own life. Uh, let me just read these very famous lines, which Socrates also quotes here. I would rather be on the soil, a serf to another, to a man without lot, whose means of life are not great, than rule over all the dead who have perished. Now, no wonder, I think, that Socrates, as founder here, would prefer that his noble puppies not read lines like this in Homer, which amount to saying that Achilles thought dying nobly for the sake of his friend wasn't such a good deal for himself, after all. And that Homer includes these and other comparable lines in his poems tends to confirm an interesting observation that, that Socrates had made early on here, apparently just in passing, that there are, as he puts it, hidden meanings in the poems that the young people don't see. An intriguing suggestion. But the education uh, of the guardians, or the warriors as they're called, it's marked not only by keeping um, certain truths from the young. For example, that even heroes sometimes fear death. In fact, the discussion of education here all but begins with a discussion of lies, of what Socrates calls noble lies. That means that there are, in principle, noble lies, according to Socrates, ones that have a beneficial effect on those who hear them. Let me quote what he says here, because it's an important passage. Then it's appropriate for the rulers, if for anyone at all, to lie for the benefit of the city in cases involving enemies or citizens, while all the rest must not put their hands to anything of the sort. So they shouldn't lie. Only the rulers can. Now, as this quotation uh, makes clear, the best city will have a guardian or soldier class, but that class won't rule. The best city, then, isn't a kind of military government. 
But who will rule? It's just this question that Socrates raises once he's sketched the guardian's education. Their rulers, uh, Socrates argues, should be the best among the guardians, plucked out from the guardians. They must above all love their city, and he loves it best, he says, who sees in a way no tension between his own good and the good of the whole. Now, what Socrates has in mind here, I think, is not quite selflessness or self-sacrifice, but a kind of blurring of one's own good with the common good. And it's in this context that Socrates suggests the necessity of telling a noble lie of grand proportions. In fact, I think you have to say fairly, it's a real whopper of a lie. First, he says, everybody should believe that they were born of the earth. And he doesn't mean sort of metaphorically or poetically, like Mother Russia, for example. You actually, literally should believe that you were born of the earth. And if the rulers themselves don't quite believe this, then everybody else should. Why? The citizens will defend the city or country because it really is their own mother they are to believe. But that's not all. It gets worse. The noble lie has a second part. It so happens that the God mixed into the souls of each citizen one of three metals. Gold in the case of the rulers, silver uh, in the case of the guardians or auxiliaries, and iron and bronze in the case of the craftsmen. Now the purpose of this part uh, of the noble lie, I think, is, is probably clear enough. Each citizen is ordained by a god in the class in which he finds himself, and therefore he should accept it gladly. No revolutions, no revolts, in short. There is, however, this crucial concession to nature. It can happen, according to the lie, that a golden child will be born to a silver parent, for example, and so that child must be raised as a future ruler not as a future soldier. Now, toward the very end of Book 3, Socrates happens to mention, apparently just in passing, that the guardians will not have any possessions or private property. Why? Because that might introduce interests and concerns different from those of the community. And he notes, too, that they will live in common without private families. Now, maybe it's needless to say that these momentous provisions, which he ma mentions just in passing, require more elabor elaboration and they will receive it, as we'll see uh, at the beginning of Book 5. But for now, the boys are content to let Socrates off the hook, or not to press him on these controversial points. And it's shortly after this, early in Book 4, that Socrates announces, we founded our city, let's look for justice in it. Now Socrates proposes the following somewhat odd procedure, I would say, to discover justice. Since their city is the perfectly good city, it will have the principal virtues in it, namely wisdom, moderation, courage, and justice, the big four. So he says, let's identify all the virtues in it except justice, and whatever's left over, that will be justice. A kind of process of elimination, he suggests. And once we've identified justice writ large, then of course we can see it clearly in the individual, justice writ small. Then what we'll do is compare the two, justice in the city, justice in the individual, and, if they're the same thing, our task will be complete. Now, you might well object here, Thrasymachus would object if he hadn't been so thoroughly tamed by Socrates, that this is an example of the logical fallacy of begging the question. To assume that justice will be a part of the best city, isn't that to assume the very thing we're trying to prove, namely that justice is good? More than that, Socrates' procedure here requires, as he notes, that the city be strictly analogous to the individual, or more precisely to the individual soul. Now his official argument uh, to this effect runs as follows. The city has three parts that correspond exactly to the three parts of the soul. In the city there are the rulers, which is the part that calculates and that possesses wisdom. There are the soldiers, the, the spirited part of the city that has courage. And then of course the craftsmen, the part that has desires, and that's concerned with money-making. Turning to the soul, then, Socrates argues that it too has three, and only three, parts. Reason, which governs. Spiritedness, or spirited anger, which, which prompts us to be courageous and is subordinate to wisdom, the reasoning part. And then finally, each individual soul has desire, which is properly ruled by reason. So far, so good. Now, many scholars have noted 
problems with this analogy. For example, is it really true, as, as Socrates maintains, that our spirited anger is always in the service of our reason, never in that of our desires or passions, for example? But for our purpose, I think it's enough just to note Socrates' own reservation about this otherwise very neat analogy. He argues that the portrait of the soul that it relies on is inadequate. Uh, let me quote this passage. Know well, Glaucon, that in my opinion, we'll never get a precise grasp of it, that is, of the question whether the soul has three and only three parts, on the basis of the procedures such as we're now using in the argument. There is another longer and further road leading to it. Now, we'll try to speculate a little later in, in this lecture why Socrates might rest content with a procedure he in a way announces isn't adequate, and what the most important consequence of this inadequacy might be. I suggest this procedure, that we compare with one another all the virtues that Socrates describes here. That is, let's compare political wisdom with wisdom in the individual, political with individual courage, political with individual moderation, and of course, finally, but most importantly, political justice with individual justice. Because I think in doing this, we're going to make an interesting discovery. So let me go through each pair of the virtues pretty quickly, and then we'll make some more general comments. So first then, political wisdom. Socrates defines it as a certain knowledge by means of which the city deliberates on behalf of itself as a whole. And I think that, that makes a lot of sense. You could say sound political judgment. As for the individual, the individual is wise by means of, and I quote, that knowledge in him of what is advantageous for each part of his soul and for the whole composed of the community of these three parts. In other words, the ruler's wisdom looks to the good of the city. The individual's wisdom looks to the advantage of his own soul. Next, courage. Socrates defines political courage as the power to cling to an opinion about what is and what's not frightening, an opinion, he says, that's instilled in us by the law. In the individual, courage is the ability to preserve what's, uh, what's proclaimed by reasoned arguments to be frightening and not frightening. Political moderation, Socrates finds, in the ability of each of the three parts or classes of the city to do what it ought. The desires and spirited anger there are as they ought to be. In relation to another, both are ruled by reason. So that the whole city can be said to be moderate because its passions are properly governed or, or ruled. Now, individual moderation, he says, is found when the two lower parts of the soul, that would be desire and anger, are similarly ruled by, by reason. Again, I would say, so far, so good. Now we come to the climax of their inquiry, the discovery of justice. In the case of the city, Socrates identifies justice as each part or class doing its own work, its own duty, and doing it well, or as he puts it, minding its own business. In this way, by the way, political justice seems very close to moderation, as he had described it. In any case, in, as for justice in the individual, it's the harmony that results from each part of the soul doing its own work or minding its own business. All right, so now let's step back a bit. It would seem that the Republic could end happily at the end of Book 4. Socrates and his interlocutors have found a definition of justice, each part of the city or the soul minding its own business or, or doing its own work well. And as Socrates himself goes on to say, if this is their definition of justice, hasn't the question of the goodness of justice become, as he puts it, ridiculous? That is to say, become completely unnecessary. Why? Because if justice is equivalent to the proper working of the political community and of the individual soul, how could justice not be a very, very great good for each and for all? But it's just here that I think we can begin to see a problem. And the reason, by the way, the Republic has to continue for, for six more books. I just said that Socrates and his interlocutors discover a definition of justice. Well, this isn't quite correct. Together they discover not a definition, but two definitions of justice. One in the community, 
one in the individual. And I suggest that Socrates' entire approach here, by splitting the city from the individual, or the individual from the city, results not in a, a resolution of the problem of justice, but rather its, its repetition or clarification. Remember what Thrasymachus has taught us. We need to know that the demands of the healthy or, or properly functioning community are the same as the demands of the health or proper functioning of the individual. We need to know, in other words, that the duty or work imposed on us by the political community, on which political justice depends, is the same work or task or activity that would render us as individuals healthy or make our souls properly functioning. In other words, if I am a dutiful soldier in this city and so contribute to the common good or to political justice, I do my own work well, will my own individual or private soul for that very reason be made healthy and whole? To put the problem in the stark terms forced on us by, by Thrasymachus, in minding my own political business or in carrying out my political duty, and so being just in that sense, am I thereby securing the good of my own soul? Or am I just being a sucker, a dupe, a worker? We might suppose a perfect congruence between political duty and individual need, since, remember, only those with silver in their souls will be the soldiers. But, of course, this neat solution to the problem rests on what Socrates himself calls a lie, if a noble lie. And when Socrates turns to, to spell out the two kinds of justice, political and individual, he does something pretty radical. He all but dismisses political justice as a mere phantom of justice, his term, phantom. True justice, apparently, is more the individual justice. And so far from being the concern for the well-being of political things, it's entirely inward-looking. I think the passage here is too important not to quote. In truth, justice was, as it seems, something of this sort, namely each doing his own work. However, not with respect to a man's minding his external business, but with respect to what is within, with respect to what truly concerns him and his own. He doesn't let each part in him mind other people's business, but really sets his own house in good order and rules himself. In all these actions, he believes and names a just and noble action, one that preserves and helps produce this condition in his own soul. Now, this is, to be sure, a strange understanding of justice. Whatever contributes to the health of my soul is justice, according to this account. That could be the study of physics, for example. In separating individual from political justice, Socrates has made his task, in a way, easier. He can describe the health of the community separately from the health of the individual. But that, in a way, avoids the big question, the challenge of Thrasymachus. Are these things compatible? The same reservation, I think, can be made about all the virtues discussed here. Take wisdom, for example. Political wisdom is the knowledge of what's best for the community as a whole. Fine. Individual wisdom is knowing what's best for me as a whole unto myself. But the crucial question is this. Is the content of each wisdom always and necessarily the same? I think the most cautious thing to say here is that Socrates hasn't proved that they are the same. Might not what's good for the community in a given circumstance be very different from what's best for me? Or take courage. Uh, political courage depends decisively on what the law says is terrible. Individual courage depends, he says, on reasoned argument, on a logos in Greek. The law and reason may teach us to fear the same thing, but must they always do so? It's my suggestion that Socrates means for us to raise these and, and comparable reservations about his whole procedure. In doing so, we'll see with, with greater clarity the problem of justice. On the one hand, we sense that Justice has to be a sense of, of duty, of obligation, to a whole that's greater than ourselves. This is captured, I think, beautifully by his account of political justice. But we sense, too, that, that justice, whatever it is, 
has to be good and even a very great good, not least for those who are, are just themselves. And again, this is captured very beautifully by Socrates' account of individual justice. But by the end of Book 4, uh, the challenge of Thrasymachus or the challenges of, of Glaucon and Adiamantus, they remain. Can the two senses of justice be put together into a coherent whole? And now I think we are ready to turn to the next section of the Republic.